And there were vast differences, for example, between the Asians and blacks uh, in terms of how many got high math uh, grades. What struck me was that for both the Asians and the Africans, the number of uh, hours that you spent working or doing homework in math was almost identical with the same percentage who got high grades in math. So that whether you are black or Chinese, if you spend an awful lot of time on the math, you're going to be doing better than the person who's not. And although there were great disparities, the disparities were differences in how much time you spend on math homework. Well then, conversely, Dr. Soule, are you not saying that groups who do not overachieve are groups who don't work hard enough? Sometimes, but sometimes the government itself makes it impossible or very difficult for groups to work hard enough. Uh, the minimum wage law is one classic example. Occupational licensing laws are another. Insofar as the school system fails, those groups that don't have an independent educational tradition are, in, are, are lost. Whereas if you have that independent tradition, even if you go to a bad school, if the parents can help you, uh, if you get the maximum that you possibly can from the books and so on, uh, you still may achieve quite a lot. So it's a combination. It is, it, is, it is the culture, but at the same time, insofar as the society puts barriers, particularly the government, which has tremendous power, and supplies education and other kinds of things, insofar as they do that, they make it tougher for you to do it. Well, are you, do you suspect that you may be guilty of de-emphasizing the effects of racism in that, in that pattern? There's, as always, everything is a possibility. But as I look at the data, I don't find any correlation between the degree of racism and the degree to which groups advance. That is, if you look at the history of the Chinese in Southeast Asia, uh, the hostility they have uh, encountered there will compare with any hostility blacks have encountered here. Uh, there have been a number of occasions in the history of Southeast Asia where the number of Chinese killed in a few days exceeded all the blacks lynched in the history of the United States. So they are enormously hated. What about Jews? You, you the make Jews, it. of course. The same, the same thing has happened with the Jews in numerous times. Thousands kill here, thousands kill there. And of course, under the Nazis, millions killed. The groups, incidentally, which have suffered the most violence, and I use that as one index of group hostility or racism, those groups have typically been middleman minorities. The Chinese, the Jews, the Armenians, uh, the Igbos in Nigeria, 30,000 of those were killed in massacres uh, just uh, within our time. Um, and yet I don't find any correlation in the long run between the economics uh, and the political hostility. All right, let's get back to the primary criticism uh, of your book made by a, a writer I really respect, William Raspberry, syndicated columnist. He says that you make these points, but you don't say what we should do. What we should first of all do is understand what does and does not work. I don't consider myself to be a policymaker, despite what the media may try to say. I consider myself to be someone who tries to supply facts so that those who do make policy will know what they're talking about, as they usually do not. Now, speaking of what the media says, you have uh, stopped giving interviews for the last couple of years. Yes, I should have start, stopped uh, many years <laughs> before that, actually. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> Uh, I see no correlation between what I say and what the media reports. Uh, one of the most uh, hideous things that I've seen reported in, uh, was on the CBS Morning News where they said or suggested that I uh, was a believer in the uh, theory of genetic inferiority of blacks. Now I have been arguing against that theory for more than 10 years and I don't know how many books, how many articles, and how many lectures. This was so well known that British television tried to arrange a debate between Arthur Jensen and me. I don't know why the word got to London, but it never got to Washington. So you have been wary, uh, to say the least, of the media. I think that's an understatement. Speaking of your book, it, is there something that you definitively found that you did not suspect before you did your research in terms of uh, group achievement or the lack of group achievement, as can be applied to, mm -hmm. to a multiracial society such as the United States? One of the things that surprised me was how uh, little correlation there was between acculturation and achievement. Would you define that for us? But, that is, taking on the culture of the surrounding society. That the Chinese, for example, in Southeast Asia, in many cases, will live for generations there, maintaining their own culture, their own language. The Germans have done this in Russia and various parts of South America, other parts of the world. Uh, and yet, uh, when we look at groups like Hispanics, those Hispanics who don't learn English are far behind those Hispanics who do in terms of, of incomes and occupations. And what I finally got out of all of that was that if you're working for someone else, then you must know the culture of that society. If you're able to set up your own farms, your own businesses, 
uh, being independent professions, it doesn't really matter that much. But if you have to go out and work for someone else, then you must know his language, you must know how his culture operates in order for you to operate in it. What else did you find out about the Hispanic culture? That it was not like the culture, for example, of, of the Germans, that in Hispanic countries, uh, various other groups such as Germans in, in Latin America have disproportionately contributed to the industrialization of these, of these countries. The British have done so also. Uh, that in a number of countries of Latin America, the Germans, the British, other groups like that, uh, actually dominate many of the industrial enterprises of those countries. It also argues against the, the uh, case of what society does. Clearly in a Hispanic society, there is not discrimination against Hispanics. Uh, and so therefore you, can explain why, you cannot explain why Jews, Germans, and other groups, Japanese in, 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 uh, uh, in parts of, of Latin America, have done better than the native Hispanic peoples of those countries. In terms of uh, education of blacks in the United States, you point out that over 50% of the PhDs awarded to blacks is in education. And you don't seem to think much of a PhD in education. It's not a question of what I think, it's a question of what the marketplace thinks. And there's not much money in that. So if you're going to compare blacks and whites who have PhDs, you have to realize you're talking about apples and oranges. If you're going to compare uh, uh, you know, blacks and uh, Asians with PhDs, you are really talking about apples and oranges, since the Asian PhDs will be disproportionately in math, science, technology, and fields like that. So that, uh, I think that's a rational choice to some extent. Insofar as people have not had the same educational background, they must do what they can do, not what they would like to do. What's encouraging to me is that second generation blacks in college, that is blacks whose parents went to college before them, are majoring in mathematical and other such areas to almost exactly the same extent as the general society. So again, as you break these numbers down, there is a sign of progress, but there's very little sign of any kind of miracle taking place. What do you mean miracle? That is, there are people who will talk in terms of what the proportion of blacks are who earn so much or are represented in various occupations. Uh, you're not going to be an engineer unless you've got an engineering degree. Uh, and if blacks' degrees are in education, then we don't expect to find blacks represented in engineering in proportion to blacks in the society. So that's an example in which our cultural choice determines our income. Our income is, is partly due to the income gap between blacks and whites. Is that part of it? Yes, yes. But well, that's true not only with blacks and whites, it's true right across the board. Uh, the difference between Asians and, Hispa and Hispanics, for example, at the, at the PhD level and earlier, uh, is uh, slightly greater than that between blacks and uh, Asians, or certainly greater than that between blacks and whites. So the black-white difference that we're always com comparing is not at all unique. The, the, the income difference between Japanese Americans and Puerto Ricans is higher than that between blacks and whites. And yet if you explain the black-white difference in terms of the unique history of blacks, you are left out of the limb wondering, well, then why then do the Japanese exceed the Puerto Ricans by so much when their history is absolutely different from either of those two groups? Now, you point out that the third world is larger than the first world, the Western world, and the second world, the communist bloc combined. Yes. But you, you don't feel that there's much cohesion there or much probability of it working as a unit. No, no. One of the reasons that they're poor is because of the lack of cohesion. That if you spend your time fighting each other instead of uh, working things out, uh, you, you can't expect to do as well as people who uh, work things out. Now, unfortunately, in the West, many of the working things out has meant that the strong have conquered the weak. What about the role of politics in, in the economic future of blacks in this country? Again, I would draw upon the uh, experience of other countries and other, other uh, groups. I can't think of a single group anywhere in the world that has risen from poverty to affluence through politics. There are any number of groups that have risen from poverty to affluence through almost every other conceivable means. When I look at the groups that have had spectacular rises, like the Jews or the Chinese, they are almost invariably groups that stayed away from politics. And they usually stayed away until after they became affluent. Some of them, them could then afford to go into politics. But that was not the mechanism by which they got where they are. What was the mechanism? Uh, basically work, skills, saving. Now, you're saying then that the, that the train in the black community, in terms of voter registration and political power, uh, political empowerment, is on the wrong track. I think that if what you expect out of that is economic advancement for the mass of black people, now if all that you're looking for is some advancement on the part of the, of the leaders, or if what you're looking for uh, is something like what happened in the Civil Rights Revolution, where you needed to get the Southern Jim Crow system broken, that was an enormous achievement through politics, as I point out in the book. 
Uh, so it's not that politics can't do anything. It's a question that politics, like everything else, has some things it can do and some things it can't do. And from what I've seen of groups around the world economically, one of the things it seems not to be able to do is raise groups from poverty to affluence. Well, who, who controls the society? Those that are in, in the political control or those in economic control? Those with economic skills tend to advance, whether they have any political power or not. And those without those skills tend not to advance, even when they have great political power. Well, what about dominating a society? Do you dominate a society through pol politics, or do you dominate through economics? Depends on how you define it. But in Malaysia, for example, the Malays have overwhelming political domination of their society, and they use it ruthlessly against the Chinese minority. The Chinese still make double the income of the Malays, on the average. You make a statement in your book, Dr. Sol, and I would like to quote, discrimination has been pervasive, but not pervasively effective. Yes. What does that mean? It means that people have discriminated against other people wherever they've had the power to do it, almost everywhere in the world and almost every period of history. Some groups are kept back by this and some groups, it seems to make no difference whatever. Insofar, for example, as you have entrepreneurial skills, the fact that people didn't hire Jews in the 19th century didn't stop Jews from hiring each other and setting up and dominating industries such as the garment industry or the uh, beginning of the great Hollywood movie studios and other areas of the economy. Uh, it is the skills that are crucial and, not the, and not, not the fact that other people are willing or unwilling to hire you. Even groups that, that have a great animosity towards other groups will nevertheless hire members of those groups with skills in the long run if there are enough of them to make it worth their while. What's the lesson in that statement for black Americans? Skills are what matters. Uh, if other people will not uh, acknowledge your skills in the short run, then those same skills are useful in the black community with other blacks. Uh, it's what has made other groups advance from poverty to affluence. I know of nothing else that's really done it. Skills and, of course, the, the, the work and the savings. transcript, send $2 to Tony Brown Productions, 1501 Broadway, Suite 2014, New York, New York, 10036. Please include program topic and allow three weeks for delivery. Tony Brown Productions produces this program and is solely responsible for its content. Tony Brown's Journal is brought to you by Pepsi-Cola Company and your local Pepsi bottlers.